And now let me share the screen a little bit here and make co-host anyway. And yes. And can everyone still hear me and say hello, Jennifer, and make sure everyone can hear you. Hello, uh, everyone. And uh, feel free also to use the chat uh, function on the uh, right-hand side or below, however you have it organized. Um, if there are any questions that come through, uh, I will try to relay those comments, questions, concerns, or anything to Jennifer. By the way, my name is Matthew Clevin or Matt Clevin. I'm the adult services librarian here at the Wilson County Public Library of Wilson, North Carolina. Um, and we're so happy to have the National Park Service. Um, makes it sound so official and government sounding. <laughs> um, Jennifer Shackelford, who is with the Mammoth Cave uh, in Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, which she told me is actually a town with its own zip code too. That's how big it is, it has its own zip code. Um, so I'm gonna ask if people mute themselves if they're not already. Also, before we start, can everyone please let me know who else is in the room with you? Because right now I do see eight participants, but that means eight cameras. Some people might be sharing um, the camera and sharing computers. So if you can please let me know in a chat function how many people are in the room watching with you so we can get an accurate count. That'd be greatly appreciated. I'm sure Jennifer keeps track of that as well. Uh, so it boosts all of our numbers. Um, just wanna make sure I got everything else with my notes and all that. And I think I've covered everything. So uh, I thank you again for doing this. Thank you for joining us. And it's in your hands now, Jennifer, take it away. Thank you very much, Matt. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ranger Jennifer, and I'm really happy to talk with all of you today about Mammoth Cave National Park. And we're going to look at some of the animals that live inside the cave. Later on, I have some pictures of those. And we're actually going to take a virtual cave tour. So if you were here today, and I was taking you on the historic tour, I have went through the cave and took pictures of all the cool stuff. So we're going to look at that today. We're going to pretend we're going through the cave and then we're going to make a stop and look at some of the cool animals we have as well with some pictures. So can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Wonderful. Okay. I'm going to share my screen and I'll be back in a little while. Um, full view here so you all can ask me questions, but I'm going to share my screen and show you the Mammoth Cave. So let me find this proper picture. Sorry, guys. Give me just a second. All right. So what I am hoping you all will be able to see in a moment is the big entrance sign to Mammoth Cave. Give me a thumbs up if you see a park service symbol and Mammoth Cave National Park sign. Okay, so that symbol on the left, and I'm gonna get myself a little pointer so I can show you stuff. Oh, let's make it bigger than that. Let's make it a laser pointer. Here we go. This is really important to the National Park Service, and it is pretty much just what we're all about. Um, we have mountains here and trees. These things represent um, all the different nature type things that you can find in the Park Service. There's a lake right here. This is a bison because our national parks have lots of animals. And the shape is an arrowhead. And that represents our cultural history here in the United States. And I'm not sure if you all know this because I see we have some younger viewer here. Um, viewers here, but one of the coolest things about the national parks is they belong to every one of us. All of you all are owners of your national parks. Isn't that neat? So Mammoth Cave, it belongs to you. And every other national park, there's over 400 units in the United States. They belong to all of our citizens here in the United States. And we let everybody visit too. We love to have visitors from all over the world. But anytime you drive up to a national park, you're going to see a big sign. And they always look pretty much alike, 
except they have a different name on them. So welcome to Mammoth Cave National Park. This is the historic entrance into Mammoth Cave. And this is a natural entrance that fell in a long, long time ago. You all might have heard of sinkholes before, and it's kind of like a kitchen sink. Water flows down through here, and because of weathering and erosion, it carves out big, giant cave passageways. And Mammoth Cave is the longest cave in the entire world. We have over 412 miles of passageway. So that's a lot of cave. And there is no end in sight. And it's continuous. You can get to every bit of those 400 miles from right here at these stair steps. Now, there are 27 entrances that we know of, and there could be more. But as of right now, we know there's 27. And we are open every day of the year except for Christmas Day. So if you come here in the winter and we have snow on the ground, we're gonna clean off the steps kind of <laughs> pretty good and you're still gonna get to go down inside the cave. And the reason we can be open every day is because the cave is always 54 degrees. No matter what it is like outside, once you get down inside the cave, it's always 54. And that is because the cave takes on the average temperature of the above ground. So if you go to Mexico and you go in a cave, they have much warmer temperatures because it's closer to the equator. Um, so maybe their cave is 70 degrees every day. Or if you go up to New York um, and go inside a cave, it's gonna be cooler. But here in Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, um, it is 54 degrees, that's the average. Now, once we walk inside the cave a little ways, we're gonna close the door behind us. There's gonna be a park ranger just like me in the front and we all, no matter what national park you go to, we all have on the same kind of uniform. We wear a shirt that has that arrowhead badge on our left side. We have a badge that says national park ranger and then we have our name tags. And the ranger in front is gonna to talk to you and the ranger in back, they're gonna lock the door so people can't come in and out and get lost. But those bats that we're gonna learn more about later, they're really important to our ecosystem. And so we have really special gates on all 27 of those entrances. This is called a bat gate and it kind of looks like metal mini blinds. And we close these gates and the bats can fly in and out but people can't get in unless they have a key. And also it lets the air go in and out of the cave. And the cave breathes naturally. There's always air flowing in and out. So we don't have to pipe in air. A lot of people ask that and they think that, but we don't have to do that. So we're gonna walk a little bit farther into the cave. This is an area called Houchins Narrows. Um, it's named after a young man named John Houchins who rediscovered the cave in the late 1700s. Um, they say that he was out hunting with a big, long Kentucky rifle and he shot a bear. Some people say the bear chased John into the cave. Some people think um, he chased it. We're not really sure, but this is called Houchins Narrows because of that story. After about five minutes inside the cave, we get to this big giant room called the Rotunda. And the Rotunda is one of the largest rooms in the cave. You could fit um, most people's houses, like a, a normal kind of three bedroom, two bathroom house. You could put that down here. So it's a really big room. And in the middle of the room, are some really cool artifacts. So we're getting ready to see some pictures of those. All right, so here inside the rotunda, there used to be an operation that happened, a mining operation in the early 1800s. So many of you all probably remember studying about the War of 1812. When the War of 1812 was happening, um, Great Britain, had blockaded our ports so we could no longer um, 
you know, get ships that would come in and bring us things like gunpowder. And we needed gunpowder because we were fighting a war against Great Britain. And so the people here in Kentucky and at a lot of other caves in the area, they had discovered that they could use the dirt inside the cave and they could get the nitrates out of that dirt and end up making black gunpowder. And so this works kind of like a coffee pot. They built these big boxes and they call those leaching vats. And they would throw the dirt down inside these vats and then they would bring water in and let the water flow down over the dirt. And after a few days, what they ended up with was called niter beer. And they would pump that niter beer out to the surface and they would add in things that had a lot of potassium, like turnips, maybe banana peels. Um, and then they would add in things like ashes from fires. And eventually, after a kind of long process, they would end up with black gunpowder. And so a lot of the gunpowder that was used in the War of 1812 was actually produced from the dirt inside Mammoth Cave. Now, one of the things that is, is something that's sad about our history is even though we were doing this, um, we were having the War of 1812 and we were trying to keep our freedom as a young United States of America, the people who were doing all this work inside the cave, they were actually enslaved people. So they didn't have a choice. Um, the owners of the cave, because a long time ago it wasn't a national park, in the 1800s it had private owners, they actually have ens had enslaved people that they had to do um, all of this work. And these are just some more pictures of the leaching vats. Um, they used a lot of just trees. They would take the trees and cut them in the middle. That's how they made their filtration system down here. And we're gonna walk a little bit farther past the rotunda and we're headed towards an area of the cave called the church. And on the way to the church, we see some of the pipes that were used to bring water in and out of the cave. Um, these are hollowed out tree trunks. They are tulip poplar trees. And tulip poplars are the state tree of Kentucky. They have very, very straight tree trunks. So they're used a lot of times nowadays for things like telephone poles. Um, but in the early 1800s, they would cut these down and they would use a tool called a spoon bit auger. And they would turn that spoon bit auger and drill the inside of the tree out. And then they, once they were hollow, they would shove them together. And that's how they got the niter beer out of the cave and the clean water into the cave. All right. So. This is a picture of walking into the church at Mammoth Cave. Um, the reason it's called the church is because in the 1800s, we know that a lot of the local people would go inside here to hold church services because of the natural air conditioning. And so the rock right here where I'm shining my light, this is called Pulpit Rock. And this is where the preacher would stand and all the um, other people would be down here on the ground and you would watch him standing up there as he would preach. Now, a little bit farther in the cave, we have some more of those saltpeter mining, those vats. So they, they went pretty far back in the cave with this process. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. And then we have an area called um, Booth's Amphitheater. <coughs> I should have got myself some water, I'm sorry. And Booth's Amphitheater is um, named that because of a young gentleman that you guys um, may or may not have heard of. His brother was very famous because he assassinated um, our president, Abraham Lincoln, a long time ago. <clears throat> but this gentleman, he was a famous actor. Um, they say he was kind of like the Brad Pitt. He was a really, really popular actor. And so we call this Booth's Amphitheater um, because John Wilkes Booth's brother came here and he stood up on these rocks and he gave a soliloquy from Hamlet. So he stood up there and he did the to be or not to be, that is the question. And all the visitors got to watch him back in the 1800s. So now this section of the cave and these rocks right here we call Booth's Amphitheater. 
And if you walk farther back, we um, actually call it Gothic Avenue once you get back a little ways. And Gothic Avenue has some super, super cool signatures. Um, here's 1837. There's another 1837. Um, here's one from 1832. Looks like Laura Irwin visited in 1832. And all of these signatures are actually candle smoke writing. If you look really closely, they are individual little circles of soot. And so the visitors would go on their cave tour and they would take a candle that was nailed onto the end of a long stick or a long pole. And they would stand there and put dot after dot after dot of soot. And sometimes when they finished, they would realize that their entire name was backwards. And that's because they would hold a mirror in their hand and they would write their name on the ceiling sometimes using that mirror so that I guess their neck didn't hurt. And so it's kind of funny that there are some, some backwards signatures inside Mammoth Cave. Now you can't put your name on the ceiling or the walls anymore because we're a national park. In 1941, that's when we became a national park, but this is called historic graffiti because it's from the 1800s. And we know a lot about the visitors from those days. There were some famous people that visited, lots of really cool stories. Um, we know that during the Civil War, there were actually soldiers from both sides that visited Mammoth Cave because they left their names behind. Um, inside Gothic Avenue, there are quite a few monuments. That's what this is. And these are just rocks that are stacked up really tall. And sometimes they'll have the name of a college or a town. So um, perhaps you went to college at Harvard. You would come here with some of your friends and you would build a monument and then you would put a sign on it that said Harvard 1852 or something like that. And so there's quite a few monuments from different colleges all within Gothic Avenue. This is the only one that touches the ceiling. This is called the Kentucky Monument. And when you go a little bit farther in Gothic Avenue, you end up at this really pretty place called the Bridal Altar, the Bridal Chamber. And people used to get married here before we became a national park. Um, on the internet, there are some really, really cool pictures of um, grooms and brides standing right here getting married under these formations. And all of these formations are limestone rock. So just like a piece of gravel outside in a driveway, the ceiling, the walls, these rocks right here, it's all limestone. This has just been redeposited in a prettier way. And we'll learn about those formations here in a little bit. I'll explain the different formations. This lady is named Jenny Lind. And if any of you all have watched the musical that came out a few years ago, it's called The Greatest Showman. She, um, her character is in that musical. But Jenny Lind visited Mammoth Cave back in the 1800s. She was on a tour and she came here as a visitor. And she was really famous, so people knew who she was. And she sat down inside this formation. So this is now called Jenny Lynn's armchair, because she sat right there. So we're leaving Gothic Avenue on our cave tour. And we have went back into these, we went down the stair steps at Booth's Amphitheater. And now we're back in the big, big main part of Broadway Cave. And in just a moment, we're going to be at something called Giant's Coffin. Here we go. This rock is enormous. Um, if you were standing here, you'd be way down here at the bottom. Um, it's bigger than a few big pickup trucks put together. So it's a really, really big rock. And they call it the giant's coffin because it kind of looks like a coffin. Um, you'll notice there is a name, Kozad. 
We think that that is named after a town that's out west. Um, we think maybe some visitors came and wrote that on there a long time ago in the 1800s. Um, there's also a signature of a famous doctor. His name is Dr. McDowell. Some people call him the mad doctor. Um, he visited here in 1839. And if you've ever read um, any Mark Twain books, um, maybe about like Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, um, Dr. McDowell, uh, he was actually kind of from that area um, in Missouri. And so um, there's some pretty cool stories about Dr. McDowell. If you want to do some research, you can probably find some, some neat stuff on him. And after you go down behind the giant's coffin, um, we walk through a room called the wooden bowl room and we're going deeper into the cave. So we were on the surface and then we walked down um, those stair steps. And at this point, when you're in the wooden bowl room, you're about 125 feet below the surface. But we're getting ready to go deeper because we're gonna walk down this set of steps and these are called the steps of time. And they say, if you walk down the steps of time backwards, you add on some years to your life. So I've been trying that ever since I started working here. I always turn around and go down these like a ladder when I'm there. So we're gonna keep walking and we're headed towards the bottomless pit in Mammoth Cave and Side Saddle Pit. So we're walking on down and then we come to one of the pits. So this is Side Saddle Pit. And it is called that because the shape is supposed to be reminiscent of a lady's side saddle from back in the olden days. Um, women, a lot of times when they would ride horses, they would sit sideways and ride a side saddle. So there are a lot of pits and domes inside Mammoth Cave, and these are caused by water coming in vertically. And vertical water, um, it weathers and it erodes away these big, tall shafts and pits. Um, the bottomless pit is actually about 110 feet deep. It's really famous um, thing here at Mammoth Cave. People used to think that it was bottomless um, 200 years ago when they first discovered it, but we now know um, that it's only about 110 feet deep. If you've ever been to Mammoth Cave, this might be the one thing that most people remember. Um, Fat Man's Misery is really famous. It's so much fun to walk through. And um, we're a little bit farther down at this point. We're over 200 feet below the surface when we're at Fat Man's Misery. And I have to turn sideways to walk through Fat Man's Misery. So it's tiny. And just past Fat Man's Misery, we have Great Relief Hall. So I am looking, I have this family here. Are you guys just seeing on your screen a big giant picture of the cave? Are you all seeing, seeing that? I'm looking for a thumbs up. It says stair. Okay, awesome. We're just uh, seeing a pathway, Jennifer. A pathway. Thank you very much, sir. Um, <laughs> I've got double screens, so I'm not exactly sure what you guys, I'm hoping that's what you're seeing. So this pathway is called Great Relief Hall. And it is a great place to stop because you've just left that little tiny fat man's misery where you've been walking sideways. And I'm about five foot two and I have to bend down all tiny when I go through um, fat man's because there's also an area called tall man's. Um, so when you get to great relief, you can stand up straight and tall and also you can use the bathroom because there are restrooms down inside Mammoth Cave nowadays. Um, they weren't there 200 years ago, but now we have modern restrooms. So you can go in and take a bathroom break and wash your hands at Great Relief Hall. We're gonna walk a little bit farther down after Great Relief, and we're gonna see what is called River Hall. And River Hall is the deepest point on the historic tour. So at this point, we are 310 feet below the surface. 
So 310 feet, if you've ever been in a big skyscraper and you've went up 31 floors, imagine if you could go down underground 31 floors, that's about 310 feet. And this is the point in our tour where we take a break. We sit down on some benches, we talk for a little while and we let everyone catch their breath because we've already walked through over a mile of cave passageway and we've done a whole lot of stair steps. So while we're taking a break at River Hall, I wanna show you all something really cool. Look on the walls and the ceiling. I think it kind of looks like divots in a golf ball. And I had a kiddo one time tell me they thought it looked like somebody had took an ice cream scooper and they had been scooping and scooping at ice cream. Um, so this is all rock, but it does have that really cool look to it. And that's because when the underground river was flowing through River Hall and it was moving around, it carved out these cool little shapes that we call scallops. And you can even do a math problem and you can see how fast the water used to move through there. You can also look at those scallops and see what direction the water was flowing in. But the reason this is the bottom, um, like as low as we go on this cave tour is because we're almost down to the water table. If we walked right down through there where I'm shining my little red laser light, we would end up at an underground river called the River Styx. And this is the River Styx and it exits the cave at a spring and it flows out into the Green River. Um, but there are quite a few underground rivers inside Mammoth Cave and they're all currently carving out more cave passageway. So if we could jump in a time machine and go a million years into the future, we would be able to see even more cave passageway because right now there's water flowing underneath my feet about 360 feet below the surface down at the water table and it's carving out more cave. So we're gonna make our way up out of the cave and we're gonna look at some pictures of those cool animals. Um, but as we leave River Hall, we've got to go back up 310 feet. And if you were here even 75 years ago, you would have to turn around and you would have to backtrack all the way past everything that we've just walked past. But they built some stair steps. This is a big giant tower. It's almost 200 feet tall. So it takes a few minutes and there's a whole bunch of steps. But this is one of those big pit dome rooms that I was telling you about earlier. So outside above ground, there's some water and it's coming in and it's, it's flowing down vertically and it's carved out this really, really tall area called Mammoth Dome. It's close to 200 feet tall. And so we're gonna go up these steps at Mammoth Dome and we're gonna see a few other really cool parts of the cave. So here's where we're gonna learn about our formations. Um, the things that hang down from the ceiling, they are called stalactites. They have the letter C for ceiling and they hang tight. And they begin as these little tiny hollow things called soda straws. And this is all just redeposited limestone. So if you've ever sat a soda, or a cup of coffee on a coffee table without using a coaster, you might've noticed it left a ring behind. And drops of water, they'll sit here on the ceiling and they'll leave a ring of minerals behind. And then another and another and another, and you get a little um, hollow soda straw formation. Eventually there's some sediments, some dirts, and that um, dirt, the soda straws will get clogged up and they start looking more like a carrot, like this one hanging up here. And then they get even bigger. And that's when we say they are stalactites. Now, when the water drips down to the bottom, you'll end up with these formations called stalagmites. And you might 
trip over them. And they also have the letter G in the middle for ground. So stalagmites grow up from the floor. When they meet in the middle, we call them a column or a pillar. And here are some cavers walking through a passageway. And this is one of my favorite things that we find inside Mammoth Cave because I think it is so beautiful. Um, this is a mineral called gypsum and it's actually, it's a salt. Um, we know that those paleo Indians that were in Mammoth Cave thousands of years ago, um, they used this gypsum for something. We're not really sure exactly what they used it for, but we know they used to scrape it off the walls because we found all kinds of artifacts that they left behind thousands of years ago. Um, and it grows in different ways. This is what we call a gypsum flower. And this is what we call gypsum snowballs. Um, but it's sort of extruded. It kind of goes out of the limestone rock that mineral does. And so you'll get different shapes of gypsum. And the reason that all of this stuff is here, everything we've seen today, is because a long time ago, there was a warm, shallow ocean that covered where Kentucky is nowadays. Now there's no ocean here. Everything out here is green. I'm not seeing any deer to show you. It's awful hot outside. So they're probably out in the trees in the shade. Um, but millions of years ago, during the Mississippian time period, we know we were covered by a warm, shallow sea. Of course, we were actually down lower below the equator then. Um, because of the fossil records that we have found here at Mammoth Cave. So all three of these fossils are a type of coral called horn coral. And that ocean that was here also had lots of really cool sharks inside of it. We have found lots and lots of shark teeth inside Mammoth Cave and seashells. This is called a brachiopod. It's kind of like a clam. And here is a drawing. Oh, actually the drawing's next. This picture is cartilage. This is um, the jaw of a big shark um, that they say was about the size of a great white shark, modern day. Here's the drawing. Um, this was just finished about a year ago, this drawing. And everything you see here, we know used to live in this area because they have found fossil remains of these creatures. So we've got some sharks, a few different kinds of sharks. Um, we've got a lot of different plants and sea lilies, um, seashells. And there's no more ocean in Kentucky because a long time ago, the tectonic plates shifted, the ocean went away, but it left behind hundreds and hundreds of feet of limestone rock. So limestone is mostly composed of a bunch of seashells. Um, it's lots of calcium, calcium carbonate. Just like our teeth and our bones, that's what limestone is made out of. And just like we can drink a soda and we can um, kind of weather and erode our teeth away and get cavities, Mammoth Cave is sort of like a big giant cavity. Whenever it rains outside, that H2O, that water mixes with um, carbon dioxide and it makes carbonic acid, just like the main ingredient in a soda pop. And um, that carbonic acid, it eats away at the limestone rock and it forms caves. So the reason Mammoth Cave is so long is because we have a special cap rock up on top called sandstone. And sandstone, it doesn't weather and erode as easily as limestone. So the sandstone protects our cave and that's why it's over 400 miles long. Now we're still discovering more miles of Mammoth Cave. Um, that's Ranger Alicia and she is crawling through Mammoth Cave in this picture. Cavers wear helmets and lights, they wear gloves and coveralls, um, boots, knee pads to help protect their knees because the rocks are really sharp in places. And um, there's no end in sight. When I started working here, we had about 365 miles of passageway. Um, and I've been here 13 years. So we have found, you know, about 50 plus miles of cave in the past 13 years.
There's a picture of a caver going through a little tiny passageway. And now I have some pictures of the animals. So this is a pack rat and they live close to the entrances and exits of the cave. They are so cute. Now I can see a few of you all, so I'm gonna turn my head and look at my screen where I see you all. Have any of you all ever had someone call you a pack rat because you like to collect things or maybe you don't pick up your room good or whatever? Okay, my granny used to say I was a pack rat. I love to collect things. And so pack rats in real life, they really do that. Um, the pack rats inside the cave, their nest area is called their midden. M-I-D-D-E-N. And in their midden, you will find all kinds of things that visitors have left behind. Um, sometimes I'll see pacifiers where like little babies, their parents will be packing them and they'll drop their pessy and the pack rat picks it up. Um, I have found money before. You'll be walking by and somebody's dropped a dollar bill and the pack rat will have it there in its nest. And probably um, one of the most things you see a lot are ponytail holders. People, I guess they drop their ponytail holders and the pack rats like to pick those up. So they're really cute. And they're all over the place around a lot of the, the entrance ways down inside the cave. And they don't live in the cave all the time. They go in and out, um, but they're really super cute. All right, the next picture I'm gonna show you guys is of an eyeless cave fish. And these fish, if you look, see where I'm shining? They do not have any eyes whatsoever. They don't need them because inside the cave, it is so dark unless we're down there with lights. So over the years, they have adapted to where they don't grow any eyes. They don't need those. Um, they also don't have pigment. Do you see how you can almost see through them? Looks like you can sort of see their veins and their blood going through there. Um, that's because no sunshine in the cave. And they don't have to worry about having any pigment to their skin. Now these little fish um, have really slow metabolisms. They live a lot longer um, than their, you know, other fish up on the surface and rivers and such. And um, they're pretty much kind of, you know, one of the, the high things on the food chain in the cave. Um, they only have to eat a few times a year because they do have that slow metabolism. And they depend on detritus being washed into the cave during flooding. So that's like the leafy material, um, like decaying leaves, things like that. They'll eat stuff like that. And if you ever get to come to Mammoth Cave and go on the River Styx tour, you get to go down and see the river. And you need to be in front because they have really good um, use of their senses and they can feel vibrations using these little nerves and their fins. And they know that visitors are coming because they can feel us walking um, on those bridges and boardwalks. So try to be in front and maybe you'll get to see one but you get to see a picture of one today. We also have little crayfish down inside the cave and they look a lot like a crawdad is what sometimes we call them or a crayfish that you would find on the surface, except once again, no pigment. Um, and that's because they're down in the cave um, in the dark all the time. And then the last picture I'm gonna show you is of one of our bats here at Mammoth Cave. And we have 13 different species that live here at Mammoth Cave National Park. And I'm gonna turn off my screen so I can actually see you all better. And so I can show you all how big these bats are. And we can talk more about the bats at Mammoth Cave because it's fascinating um, some of the facts about the bats. I did not know these things until I started working here. So let me exit out of this, stop sharing my screen. All right, so I want everyone to take their hand and go like this. So you need your thumb and your pinky out, all right? The bats at Mammoth Cave, their wingspan is about like that, just a few inches, like four to five inches. I used to think that bats in Kentucky were way bigger than that, but they're not. Um, and their bodies, when their wings are folded in, 
are about the size of a chicken McNugget from McDonald's. So if you, the next time you go to McDonald's, imagine that chicken McNugget, that's like a furry little bat. So a grown bat here at Mammoth Cave, that's about how big it is. So they're, they're not very large. Um, now there are large bats. There are bats that have wingspans, you know, from my arm, from fingertip to fingertip, but those are down in South America. All of the species that we have here in Kentucky are small. So they're not those big giant fruit bats that you can find way down south. Um, another really cool fact about bats is that one bat can eat over a thousand insects in an evening. So bats are really good to have around because they eat so many bugs. And their favorite thing to eat we joke and we tell our visitors they love M&Ms. Now, not the chocolate kind of M&Ms like we like. They like moths and mosquitoes. And so they love to eat moths and mosquitoes. And we love for them to eat things like mosquitoes because nobody wants tons of mosquitoes, right? Yeah, that's no fun. <laughs> and um, they're nocturnal. So that means they sleep in the daytime. And at night, they wake up while we're snoozing and that's when they go out to eat. Now, some of you all may have heard about a really bad disease um, that has just kind of appeared in the past few years. Um, it's, it's been around less than 15 years. It's called white nose syndrome, just like it sounds, white nose. Um, it's a fungus that the bats catch and what happens to them is they wake up when they have this fungus, we think they wake up itchy during the winter time when they're supposed to be hibernating. And because they wake up, they use a lot of energy waking up when they should be snoozing and they have to go outside to find food. Well, if it's snowy and cold out and they wake up to go find food and they fly out of the cave, are there lots of moss and mosquitoes around in December and January? No. So they're actually passing away from starvation and from exposure to the cold. Um, and white nose syndrome is really bad. It has decimated a lot of the bats in the area. Our numbers are way down compared to what they were 15 and 20 years ago. Um, there is a little bit of, of kind of light at the end of the tunnel because they are noticing now that we've, it's, now that it's been around for 10 plus years, they're learning a little bit more about it. And they're noticing that there are certain species of bats that aren't affected as badly as others. Um, but it has killed just thousands and thousands of bats here at Mammoth Cave um, since it arrived here. It started in New York State. That's the first place it was noticed in the United States. And over the course of just a few years, it made its way down the East Coast and then more into Kentucky and, and it's, it's traveling kind of across the US. Um, so we first learned about it, I think around 2007, 2008, and it made its way to Mammoth Cave. Um, took four or five years to get here, um, but it's kind of a cruddy, not good thing. Um, what we do here at the park, because we know we have white nose syndrome, is anytime you visit Mammoth Cave, when you walk out of the cave, it is mandatory to clean your shoes. And so we have you walk across these squishy mats. They're um, just these biohazard mats and they are filled with a cleaner. It doesn't hurt your shoes, but it kills almost every bit of the spores of that fungus. And that way we're trying to be responsible. So if you leave here and let's say you fly over and go in a cave in Arizona, we, you know, because you've walked across those mats, you're not going to spread white nose to one of those other caves that don't currently have it. We tried to keep it away. Um, before we had it at Mammoth Cave, we would have people walk across mats before they went in, in case you had been somewhere and brought it with you. Um, but unfortunately, um, it's also spread just bat to bat. And so, you know, we're, we're definitely wanting our bats to fly in and out. So, so we ended up with it. But that's a little bit about white nose. I'm trying to think of what else is kind of fun to know about them. Um, they have eyes. I, I meet a lot of students because we work with a lot of school groups. 
And they often think that bats are blind or that they don't have eyes. And that's not true. Um, it's just because they fly at night, it's dark. And so, you know, when it's dark outside, it, it's hard to see. Um, so they use their sense of echolocation and they send a little sound waves out, like high pitched sounds. They bounce off of things and that's how the bats are able to find their way around um, since it is dark at night. So I'm going to let you all ask me some questions now, if you all would like to. Feel free to either unmute yourself or if you'd like to uh, use the chat function. And I'm not sure, Jennifer, if you can see the chat. Yes, I can. I just brought it up. Okay. Um, I'd be glad to initiate with a few questions I have of my own. I was just making a few notes and just being fascinated. Thank you for all of that. So, oh, you're welcome. I hope you all enjoyed it. And I hope you, you can come visit someday. But if not, um, you really did see pretty much the historic tour today. So that was highlights of all the really neat places along the historic tour, which is our most popular tour. How long is the average tour? Um, the average tour is two hours. But we do have um, one tour where you're in the cave almost all day. It's called the Wild Cave Tour. And you crawl around and climb, and it takes about six hours. Um, but the, the most popular tours are about two hours. And then we have a short tour called the Frozen Niagara that's about an hour and 15 minutes. So you have several tours? We do. Um, we have a as I said earlier, 412 miles, no end in sight, and there are actual trails within the cave, probably close to, I don't know, a little less than 20 miles of passageway that has, you know, walkways, and, and sometimes they're paved, sometimes they're um, older trails that were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps back in the 1930s, um, lots of different kinds of pathways through there. But different times of the year, we offer different tours. So um, we have specialty tours in the winter when we're not as busy. In the summer, we're so busy, we just kind of have our, our big tours, like the historic, um, where we can get lots of people on that one tour because the passageways are pretty large other than Fat Ants, Misery. Do you have various maps? Of, uh, has everything that you've seen so far mm -hmm. been mapped in? Are you still doing that? Are you still finding yeah. more and mapping more as you go along? We are. Awesome questions. Um, so we have maps from 200 years ago. Um, some of the maps, there was an enslaved person named Stephen Bishop who drew a map in the 1800s from memory. He was actually in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, uh, there was a, a gentleman named Dr. John Cron who owned the cave at that time, and he took Stephen up to Locust Grove. That's um, the home that his family owned. And Dr. Cron's family, you all have, have probably heard of him if you've heard of Lewis and Clark. Um, his mother was actually a Clark. Her, her brothers were, you know, the famous explorers and such. Um, George Rogers Clark was his uncle. And so Dr. Cron was there with Stephen. He drew out a map. And nowadays we have all kinds of fancy mapping tools and we can do things on the computer and everything is 3D and these cool 3D models. The map that Stephen Bishop drew is, is so just almost spot on. He did an amazing job. So it's, it's so cool to me to think that um, this gentleman who never had formal education, he just learned from the visitors that came on his cave tour. Um, you know, it's amazing that he was able to make that awesome map. Um, it's still being mapped, though, on holiday weekends, 4th of July. There's an expedition going on right now this week. Um, there have been people here for the past few days, and they're going to be here, I think, through the end of the weekend. And they're in the cave mapping. Um, it's all volunteers. They're from all different walks of life from all over the U.S. Um, I know you said we've got some folks here, I think, that are in, are they in Missouri or Kansas or where they at? I, I remember there was a you were saying uh, well, we, I used to be in that area and one of okay. were attending uh, was in uh, the Missouri area. Okay, so, um, well, the gentleman right now who is in charge of the group that's doing the mapping, he's a physician and he's from Missouri, but he's here crawling around um, going through the cave. 
So just all different kinds of people come here and they volunteer their time and do that mapping. It's all done by volunteers that are part of a group called the Cave Research Foundation. So um, who knows how long we'll be in a, in a few more years. Now you partially answered this already. Uh, mm -hmm. but one of the questions was, um, has it ever been privately owned? And you did you know, partially answer that. And I imagine the cave being as big as it is, maybe had multiple owners. How did you end up getting, had the National Park Service end up owning all this? Did they have to buy okay. people out or was it inherited or? Kind of a combination. So when Dr. Cron passed away, he never had any children. And so the estate that he owned, um, there was a hotel that he owned on the surface and quite a few acres. He left that to all of his nieces and nephews. And it was in his family for over a hundred years. Um, in 1925, and since this is a library, I'm going to tell you all some really cool books you should read. Um, in 1925, there was a gentleman by the name of Floyd Collins. And Floyd was a caver. And he was trying to discover a cave closer to town um, because Mammoth Cave had been open to the public as a tourist attraction since 1816. See, when the war was over, they didn't need that gunpowder out of there anymore. And so in 1816, they opened it up. And it's been open pretty much every day since 1816 for over 200 years. So very, very busy. And Floyd and all the other people who lived in the area, they wanted their own caves so they could make them some money. And um, he was crawling around inside a cave called Sand Cave that is much closer to town. Um, and so unfortunately a rock fell on his ankle and it trapped him and he was unable to get out. Um, after about 24 hours, people noticed that he was missing. They went searching for him and they could get to his head but they couldn't get down to his ankle because he was in a little tiny passageway that was about the size of his body. So nobody could get down there to get the rock off his ankle. So he ended up passing away. And um, there was a big rescue effort to try to get him out of the cave. And there are quite a lot of really good books that have been written about that rescue effort. So just research Floyd Collins and, and there's three or four really awesome books about Floyd Collins. But what's so... Um, kind of, I guess you could say, helped us get on the map in the sense of becoming National Park, is when Floyd was trapped, they said Congress would stop session to find out, has Floyd been rescued? It was a really, really big um, media event. So I think of baby Jessica being in the well back in the 1980s, and, and maybe um, our kiddos nowadays might remember the students in, um, I think it was Thailand a few years ago, they got trapped in a cave. But Floyd um, kind of put this? us on the government's thoughts, you know? And so um, a few years later, um, they decided, Congress decided that Mammoth Cave should be a national park. And for years, um, there were groups that were um, trying to purchase up land. Um, now, eminent domain did happen. Um, there were a lot of families who had lived in this area um, they had been given like land grants, you know, like talking like way, you know, right after the Revolutionary War, there had been people who had been here for hundreds of years and they did not want to give up their land. Um, and so some of those people um, didn't sell and some of the people, you know, eminent domain um, occurred and their land was taken from them. Um, but eventually enough land um, was acquired that in 1941, we did become a national park. And uh, some of the cool things about our park, we're a biosphere reserve, a UNESCO. Um, it's, it pretty much means that it's a really special place um, with all different kinds of ecosystems. So we've got the cave ecosystem. We have deciduous forest here. Um, we have kind of a swampy area called Sloan's Pond that's sitting on that sandstone cap rock where there's all kinds of cool things. You can find dragonfly larva and lots of neat stuff there at Sloan's Pond. Um, so because we are a biosphere reserve, um, it just, it's a neat place to, to hopefully people will like to come here and, and learn about the park and all the neat stuff that we have here. When was the Floyd Collins uh, rescue attempted? Let me see if I can pull it up and find it. 
it. I know it was in February. I'm going to put. But does it mean that uh, you know Congress was you know take a recess and find out the okay. uh, updates and everything? That was in February of 1925. Is when it happened. Um, so that's when Congress was doing all of that. And then the next year in 1926 is when Congress um, said that Mammoth Cave, Shenandoah, and the Great Smoky Mountains all needed to become national parks. So that's kind of when that enabling legislation happened was 1926. And so in my mind, I've just always kind of thought, well, in 1925, that's, you know, of course, Mammoth Cave, as I said, it had been really popular for years, but in the 1800s, the people who visited, it was more like an affluent, you know, like kind of, you know, you had to have money because you were traveling by stagecoach and by train. And then of course, in the early 1900s, more people were able, able to travel because vehicles, you know, were, were coming around um, about that time. And so 1925, um, when that happened, that's when kind of, you know, the family sitting there listening to their radio are hearing about this mammoth cave place and and we're getting more of you know kind of the middle class and they have their vehicles and they can maybe come visit Kentucky whereas the turn of the century it was more of the people who you know to travel you had to have kind of be in that you know upper <laughs> area and all to travel due to funds. So are there people who still own private land right around there and are there parts mm -hmm. of the park that are closed off, you know, private property, do not trespass sort of thing? Yeah. So the the actual park covers about 52,000 acres and it, it goes within three counties in Kentucky, Barron, Hart, and Edmondson County. Um, because the cave keeps being mapped and, and it is so large, um, it does go under some private properties and there are some entrances that we know of that are on some of those private properties. And so um, all those entrances are gated and um, the park works with those property owners um, just to make sure that those gates are safe for the bats to get in and out of, but also to make sure no one goes in there and accidentally gets harmed. Since you, know, you can go in any of these 27 areas and end up anywhere within the 400 plus miles of Cave Passageway. So yes, there is some now that is, is under private property. Have people gotten lost in there? <laughs> Have you found people like wandering? Not in, not in modern day. <laughs> now in the 1800s, I have read accounts. Um, I, I like to, to tell my students that visit, um, you know, nowadays we have social media. Everybody gets on social media and tells what's going on. But in the 1800s, you would write letters to people. Um, or you would write um, something for the newspaper. And we know a lot about those early visitors because of letters and newspaper articles from 150 years ago. And so, yes, we do know that um, back in the 1800s, there were a few people that got lost. Um, but in modern day, no, because um, as I said earlier, we always have those two rangers. You're gonna have a lead ranger and you're gonna have a trailing ranger and we make sure we keep you safe. <laughs> Smart people. <laughs> yep. Well, feel free to unmute uh, yourself and ask questions away or put questions in the uh, chat box and uh, we'll be glad to answer them. Um, I'm sure we've got some other questions out there. Oh, go ahead, Ann. Uh, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, so this might be an odd question. Do you know of a way to attract bats? We mm -hmm. had a bat house up about a year ago because we're in mm -hmm. East Texas where it's mosquito capital. And we put it up last summer and chimney and no bats. And our neighbors a couple of miles away have got bats. <laughs> um, I know that there are certain things about the bat houses that bats are attracted to. Like um, they, they need to be built in a very specific way. I actually, if you're okay with sharing your email with me, um, I have a manual that it's, it's from um, a bat conservation group and I can email you that and you can read through there and maybe get some ideas. It, it could be something as simple 
as like the measurements on the bat house might not be making your bats happy. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd be happy to email you that. Okay, should I put it in the chat or? If you're comfortable with that, that's fine. However you would like to do it. And, and I can send you that when we get off in a few minutes. Or if you guys want, um, we can have Jennifer send it to Matt and I can share it with you yes. guys if you want. I'd be interested in it as well. That sounds um, great. I'll just I'll to email it to Matt that and that way you can distribute it to everyone. Good yeah. idea. Absolutely. You, you can tell we're all gardeners. We're gardeners. She's a gardener. Scott's a gardener. <laughs> and, and Jenny's on here too. Yeah. <laughs> and Lauren. Family reunion. <laughs> <laughs> In the chat box, Jennifer, can you put your email in there? Yes. Yeah, I sure will. Oh, that'd be great. And I can put mine in as well. If people have questions, I'd be glad to pass along any other questions that come in later mm -hmm. on or inquiries or things like that. That's mine at the library. And yeah, I'll send that out here in just a little bit so you can get it to everyone. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And welcome from Texas. I love that there's people from all over. <laughs> well, Amanda invited us. So, um, She's a great salesperson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Oh, no problem. Um, it's my aunt and uncle. I've also got um, my husband, my sister-in-law, and my niece on here, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you all learned, learned a little bit and enjoyed learning about the park. We did. Thank you. We did. Very interesting. I'd been there when I was very young, mm -hmm. probably back in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. It probably hasn't changed too much since, you know, weathering and erosion is such a slow process. <laughs> probably looks about the same. We have, um, of course, some some new trails, um, but for the most part, I would say it, if you came back, I bet it would look just about like the last time you were here. Do you remember anything that you saw when you were here? Well, I, I remember the large column. Okay. And the, the Batman's misery seems to ring a bell. <laughs> that's what most people remember. I remember coming here when I was in fourth grade, and that's what I remember as Batman's misery. Yeah. Going through there. And the signatures. I remember seeing the signatures on the ceiling. I don't remember that. Any other questions? What do the pack rats do with all of that stuff? <laughs> they just they just kind of have it sitting there in their little nest area. The craziest thing I ever saw one time was a little baby shoe, like an infant. Their shoe had fell off and it was they're in the nesting area so they're um, these little hoarders huh they're just they, they they gather stuff um sometimes uh they'll they'll bring things that are from a long time ago um like flash cubes you know how people cameras back in the 70s you would have the, those cubes you put. Yeah. i guess people would maybe throw those down a long time ago and so every once in a while, you'll be walking through and you'll look in the rocks, kind of within the rocks, and you'll see a little nesting area and you'll see stuff like flash cubes <laughs> that they found and, and dragged up from, you know, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny to see what they find. Yes, there have been archaeological sites found in the cave. And yes, there have been um, remains. Um, in the 1930s, when the civilian conservation corpsmen were here, because remember 1926 is when they decided we were gonna become a park. Um, so all through the 30s, there were groups of young men here, um, pretty much until World War II began, there were young gentlemen from all over the United States that were here working. And they were building trails in the cave. They were building like picnic shelters, um, bridges, beautiful stonework from the 1930s from those um, CCC um, companies that were here working. Some of them were in the cave working on a trail and they had their lantern. And one of the, I think it was a foreman actually, kind of one of the bosses was walking around and he felt kind of a round, hairy feeling rock. 
Um, it turned out when he lifted his lantern, it was a head. Um, and it was the mummified remains of a person from thousands of years ago. Um, he still, you know, he, he still had, when I say mummified, um, it sounds, and I don't mean to, to be belittling because um, these are human remains and we want to be respectful. But if you leave, you know, something in the refrigerator, like baloney, it kind of dries up. And so that body had been in there for thousands of years. And so he still had, you know, his hair and everything and his skin. It was just kind of dried up, um, not mummified, like, you know, Scooby-Doo mummy or something like that. <laughs> and so there have been quite a few of those um, uh, paleo Indians from a few thousand years ago that have been found down inside the cave. Um, this particular one that was found in the 1930s, they did a lot of research. Um, they called him Lost John. And he was underneath um, sort of a big boulder. And when they found him, he had things around him, um, some tools. He had some shells, um, like freshwater mollusk shells from out of the river. And he was um, scratching off that gypsum, that mineral. And so that's why we know because of him that the paleo people used that gypsum. We think perhaps as a preservative, maybe as part of their diet, we don't know for sure. Um, some people think perhaps paint. Um, we'll, we'll never really know for sure. Um, but we do know that there were people in the cave two and 3,000 years ago um, because of those remains that we found. Um, we've also found a lot of slippers that were woven out of grasses that you can find down by the Green River outside um, and some gourds um, that were um, kind of hollowed out and used to transport things. So all of those things are very, very old. So yes, um, and there are drawings. There are a few different drawings on large um, rocks in the cave um, that they have dated. They've done carbon dating on um, some ladders. They found some old ladders um, that are made out of like branches and sticks tied together. Um, and those are all, you know, 2,000, 2,500 years old. So really neat that they have found those things. And there are a lot of arc sites on the surface as well. Um, there are a lot of rock shelters around the Green River and many, many different um, things have been found there like, you know, old beads, jewelry, things like that. Looking to see. What do they do with them? Um, there, I know that one of those mummified remains, um, her name was Fawn Hoof. She wasn't actually found in Mammoth Cave, but she was brought to Mammoth Cave a long time ago, um, pre-National Park. She is up at the Smithsonian, but she's not on display because one of our rangers a few years ago went up there and asked. They talked with one of the curators and um, she's like in a drawer somewhere in the archives of the Smithsonian. Um, but the rest of them are still in the cave. And they are not where anyone can see them. Um, I am not special enough to know where they are. <laughs> I don't want to. Um, there are just a few people that work here, um, like the very big bosses that know where those remains are. And um, they are out of sight, um, but uh, close to, if they find them kind of close to the visitor trails, they, they move them like Lost John he was moved away from that pathway they were building and was put, um, they say that he's, he's very close to where he was, but he's far enough away that none of us will ever see him. So not sure exactly where he is, but they're in there. Any hauntings? Many, many people think that it is a very haunted place. Um, I, I never, you know, I don't know. I don't want to say I don't, I don't believe in that or whatever, but I will say that there are places in the cave I do not like being by myself. Um, and I'll kind of sing in my head as I'm walking through those places because they're just sort of eerie. <laughs> so, um, but yes, there's been a lot of really cool ghost stories written about Mammoth Cave. So that's, that's some more books for you guys to look up. There are some really great um, ghost story books. I've read probably three or four. Um, about Mammoth Cave. Yep. I love to read. So 
you know, whenever I Love have a library that. get in touch with me, I get excited because mm -hmm. I give you lots of book ideas. Yeah, we like to hear that. <laughs> you know, you, just, you can learn, it opens up have. a whole new world. You can learn so much by reading. It's amazing. Definitely. I'm curious to see what we have in our collection now and what else is out there that we can add. Yeah, there are some really good, um, there's some children's um, kind of historical fiction books about Mammoth Cave that I've read, I think, every single one that's available. And they all, you know, of course, they're historic fiction, so there's a little bit of stuff added in. But I would think like 90% is very accurate. You know, they've, they've taken some liberties, but for the most part, it, it's, they're pretty good. You know, I've enjoyed all of them. If you can think of any uh, good ones, uh, feel free to email them to me or Amanda. Yeah. Uh, I think we should have, whether it be a travel guide or some historical fiction. Okay. Or, uh, you know, granted, but, uh, we have tons and tons, but, um, you know, Amanda's at home, but I can just see myself as soon as I hang up with you, going immediately to our virtual card catalog. Okay, Mama Cape, looking it up. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll send you um, kind of off the top of my head the few I can think of. That, Take your um, time with it. But yeah, I yeah. haven't think of any, you know, there's a new one coming out, for example. I'm, I'm making that up, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I'll let you know. But I think you guys would really be great to have, and by all means. I'll do it. Are there any other questions at all? All right. Well, thank you all so much. This has been so much fun. Um, I, I spend a lot of my time in meetings and um, I was actually in a meeting that lasted about two and a half hours this morning. So I really love when I get to talk with people and share the cave with them. So um, thank you all. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll get that bat info sent out here in just a few minutes. Um, so hopefully you guys can get some bats at your houses <laughs> and help get rid of some of those mosquitoes. Yes. Yes. Thank Absolutely. You. Enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. And so thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer. Thanks so much. Oh, you're very welcome. See you all. Take all care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I'm going to be ending the recording right now and ending the session right now. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Jennifer. And we'll be in touch back and forth as well. You're welcome. Thank mm -hmm. you all.